In this video, we interview Mr. Tim O'Keefe. Tim has got 40 years of experience as a feed formulator. He is the owner and president of Aqua Food Technologies. From him, we get a bird's eye view of feed formulation in shrimp and fish. We thank Deepak NextGen for making this interview happen. Uh, in the last 15 years, maybe even 20, um, the primary changes in manufacturing equipment and process flow have been made to save energy, more efficient production of feed, and to obtain more discrete particle sizes, the exact particle size that a fish needs with no dust and you know better water stability, those kinds of characteristics. Um, if you start from the beginning of the process of making feed, the first piece of equipment that's changed the most uh, are the hammer mills, the grinding ingredients down, reducing particle size of the ingredients to where they're both uniform in size and small enough to be highly digestible. And these changes are in things that most people wouldn't notice. It's like better air systems to draw through the hammer mill, uh, dust control, temperature control. Um, moving further down the line, there's been a realization in the last 15 years that uh, conditioning feed is very important. The more you can heat the feed and gelatinize the starch, the higher the digestibility of the diet. And the best place to do that heating is in the conditioner. And 15 years ago, we used to think 20, 30 seconds retention time in the conditioner was sufficient. Today, most of these machines have upwards of three minutes. Some have as many as five minutes of exposure to steam and water, which greatly improves the digestibility and the water stability of the pellet. And I would say that those are the primary differences. There are some other smaller ones, but for the most part, those are the biggest changes. Countries in the world are pushing to have a low fish in, fish out ratio in the feed. Most feeds don't even contain as much as 5% fish meal, when in, in the past we needed 25 or 30% fish meal. There's a finite amount of fish meal in the world. There's never going to be any more than that. So these steps towards better formulations, more accurate formulations using other ingredients have greatly reduced the dependence on fish meal. It's probably the best high protein supplement that we can buy. And it's consistent in its quality um, and composition. We know a lot more about the composition of soy today. Its digestibility and the tolerance of fish to certain par portions of soybean meal. We know more about all of those things. So soy ends up being a major source of protein in the feed. It, however, does not have a completely balanced amino acid profile. It's deficient primarily in methionine, but that's not a problem. We can get methionine from other ingredients like corn gluten meal. So the formulator uses a software package today that rapidly allows you to combine other protein sources with soy to satisfy the amino acid profile that's targeted at the lowest possible cost. Uh, it's progressing well. A lot of what it's waiting on, however, is more data for each species of fish. Within aquaculture, I mean, w there are people raising as many as 200 different species of fish, and they are as different as mice and elephants. I, and they span the whole range of differences. So. What most practical formulators are doing at this time is trying to formulate for 
herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. And within each of those groups, we have a little more data about some than others, but still not a complete data set. Having said that, almost every formulator that I know is now formulating for amino acids, not for total crude protein. It's, uh, many people do add crystalline amino acids to help balance the deficiencies in soy or in the diet after you've formulated it. Um, however, with fish, because they're fed a discrete number of times per day, and perhaps only once, um, these crystalline amino acids are less efficient than they would be if they were fed continuously all day long, as in poultry feeding. In a poultry situation, the feed is there to take at any time that they want, and those chickens sort of graze that feed all day long. So if you add an amino acid to balance it, let's say you add threonine to the diet, which soy is deficient in threonine also, if you're adding that as a crystalline amino acid and you're feeding multiple times per day, it can be very effective. If you're only feeding once, it's not so effective because that amino acid is already digested. It's in its most basic form. So it's absorbed across the gut lining immediately, goes directly out to the cells in the body. When it arrives there, there are no other amino acids to go together with it. It's in excess of the requirement. 30 minutes later, all the other amino acids arrive. They were being worked on by enzymes to break that protein down. They get there to make protein, and guess what? There's no threonine anymore, so now it's deficient in that. So if you buy a feed or you make a feed that is fortified with crystalline amino acids, the farmer and the feed manufacturer have to be working together closely and communicating well about what's the feeding program, and the feed can then be formulated to match that feeding program. It's huge. Uh, they, are, they are like elephants and, and mice. Uh, uh, shrimp are a curious creature. Um, they don't actually use any of the carbohydrates that we put into their feed. Um, in, in fish, when you feed uh, starch in particular, the energy from that starch, if it's not needed immediately for life processes, it's converted to fat and stored there so that that energy can be used again later. There are no fat shrimp. They don't store fat. <laughs> so once they've consumed a carbohydrate, even if it's a starch or sugar, it's excreted from the body. It's, that goes into the pond and has to be dealt with in the, in the water system there. They're strictly a protein user. The amount of protein that you feed is the protein that they gain, minus digestibility differences and things like that. But uh, to get a, a shrimp to grow a certain number of grams, you have to feed him a certain number of grams of protein. With a fish, that's not the case. You can, they can gain fat weight, and then they can use that fat later when they need it uh, in order to spare protein to be deposited. So that's probably the primary difference uh, between them. In many other aspects, they're similar. For example, the nitrogenous waste from breaking down protein and then making up new proteins, that's excreted across the gills as ammonia in both shrimp and in fish. So those kinds of things are not so different. In concept, I'm sure that there's a benefit to having the right gut flora, have the right kinds of bacteria and, and fungi 
in the gut to balance things out and to help everything work correctly. However, I actually have never seen any data that showed proof positive that when I take this probiotic and I put it in the feed, I get this quantifiable benefit. Everybody feels good about it. It makes sense. Probably it works. But you know what? Everything I've ever seen, you can drive a truck through the range of responses of animals receiving probiotic. So it's difficult to prove statistical significance. I guess I would have to divide that answer into two sections. One being um, if there were quality issues with an ingredient so that it's not uh, as wholesome as it should be. And an example of that might be uh, an ingredient that contains a certain amount of fat. If that fat is rancid, it's, it's undergone oxidation. So it's not as good as an ingredient which would be fresh and, and not oxidized. That can cause some, some major problems, particularly in terms of disease resistance of the fish. It increases vitamin E requirements and impacts the liver. And once the liver is compromised, the first ch bacterial challenge that comes along, the fish just gives up without a fight. Uh, so there are those kinds of things in the feed that, from just the quality standpoint, are important. But then there's also the composition. So if you don't have the right uh, composition of ingredients and nutrients, then likewise, those fish are compromised. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, starches and digestibility and storing it as fat. That's a major issue, uh, particularly in low protein feeds. It's difficult, if not impossible, to balance digestible energy and digestible protein when the denominator of that calculation, the protein, digestible protein, when that number is quite low, it's hard to get the digestible energy number low enough to balance it. If you don't have it balanced, what happens is the fish puts on a lot of visceral fat. And if he stays fat for too long, his liver becomes fatty. Then it no longer functions properly and he doesn't die from a fatty liver. He dies from the next disease that comes along. Or sometimes they just can't stand uh, environmental stresses. A little bit of low DO, low dissolved oxygen, that they otherwise could have survived just fine. They don't have the stamina to, to survive that, so they give up and die. Vitamins are another one. We almost never see a clinical symptom of a vitamin deficiency, not anymore. I mean, 30 years ago, yes. But today, there can be subclinical deficiencies that you don't, it, it doesn't cause clubbed gills or crooked backs or anything like that, but well, below that immediately visible uh, symptom, there are other things that are not performing correctly. Mm -hmm. And so those can cause problems and, and you don't even really know it. It's, it's just sneaky. It shows up in chronic mortalities. Third category would be um, uh, mycotoxins. To things that are left over from mold uh, in either the ingredient or in the feed. And again, those are not quickly identifiable. And uh, most feed mills uh, are very diligent about testing for uh, uh, molds. And if mold is present, then they go further and test and see if those mycotoxins are there. And today we have these little mycotoxin kits that are quite quick and accurate. I mean, it used to be a big deal to, to check them, but not so much now. Actually, compared to poultry, we're in the dark ages. Uh, our information about particularly uh, digestible nutrients is lacking 
uh, severely in every species. Now, some species are better than others. Uh, catfish, uh, tilapia, uh, and some other cold water species that you don't grow here. We know more about them than others, but even with those, there are holes in the data that don't allow us, for instance, to formulate on uh, uh, available amino acids. We know that's important, but we don't have the full data set to be able to do it. So as I see it in, in the future, and it's, I don't think too far in the future, things are happening quickly nowadays, um, we'll be able to formulate more accurately and be able to do things more in the way that uh, poultry is today. Extruded feed has the advantage that it can more thoroughly cook the starch, which again, if you remember, shrimp don't need it as a nutrient. It's there as a functional property to get good water stability. So by extruding that feed, you can get a lot better water stability uh, from the, the pellet. And that allows the shrimp more time to, to decide whether he's gonna eat that feed or not. And actually, if a shrimp doesn't eat feed within 15 or 20 minutes, he's not gonna go back and eat it. But we need the stability for a farmer to be able to have enough time to go back and check the trays and see if they ate it. If he's able to get back to that tray and say, say after he's done his first feeding, if he's able to come back around, check it two hours later, but its water stability is 30 seconds, I mean, uh, 30 minutes, well, his assumption is they ate it all because it's all gone, and maybe they didn't. So it's more of a case of, man it needs to be water stable for the management side of the equation. Uh, also, extruded feed, uh, can an extruder can be used to make much smaller particle sizes that are still pellets as compared to a pellet mill. The downside to extrusion is the moisture level to get it through the extruder has to be quite high and then all that moisture has to be taken back out. Going through the extruder die just by itself takes a lot more energy per ton to do it and then to take all that moisture out of the pellet to get it back down to 10% moisture costs a lot. About 40% of the manufacturing cost of extruded feed is drying. On the pelleting side, for the same horsepower on a pellet mill, you can make twice as much feed, twice as many tons per hour. And you're only making that feed at 14 to maybe 16 percent moisture. So you only have four to six percent to take back out. You have a third as much water to remove as you do in extruded feed. So the number of, of uh, kilowatt hours per ton to make extruded feed is much, much higher than for pelleted feed. My personal preference is to pellet. It's, it is, in my humble opinion, not everyone, in my opinion, it's the best tool for that job. At the end of the day, I believe the best option for shrimp feed is um, pelleting. Fish feed, I think it goes the other way. The advantages of floating feed for, for feeding fish are so great that you get your money back even though you're having to spend more money to produce that feed. Your nose and your eyes can be very good at evaluating a product like feed. If it's rancid and you open that bag, it's gonna smell like paint and your eyes will burn a little bit and you'll have this kind of fresh paint smell, you know right away that this feed is old or at least the oil that's in it has gone rancid. And that's an important first step. You have that, 
you should just roll that back up and, and not use it. Uh, you can also see mold uh, that's, that may be uh, starting to grow on that feed. In every bag of feed, even if it's 10% moisture, let's say if the bag weighs 25 kilos and it's 10% moisture, that's two and a half liters of water that's in that bag. As long as it's evenly distributed across every pellet, no problem. If it starts to migrate to a, a spot where there's going to be a higher moisture content, then it'll mold. And that moisture migration happens more often than people think. When you put a bag on a cold uh, concrete floor, moisture goes from the warmest spot to the coldest spot and it migrates right down to where that's cool and now your two and a half liters of water is now spread out over a very small amount of feed then moisture occurs and you're in trouble so a farmer could get feed from the plant if it was put on the floor you know it's possible everyone works not to have this happen but it's possible that water could be concentrated there so when he opens the bag he sees mold so there's two things that your eyes and your nose can tell you immediately the rest of it is more like is it the right particle size for my animal do I have enough for shrimp do I have enough particles per gram for every shrimp to get some yeah. Yeah. so they don't have to fight over one big pellet yeah. um, also dust is important most of the dust that goes into a pond, you don't get any benefit out of that. That, that just goes into the water and now it's fertilizer. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that they could immediately uh, detect and help uh, get a better uh, product out of it. Um, it doesn't hurt for a farmer to take, in fact, I recommend it, for a farmer to take samples of feed, he doesn't have to do anything with it other than save it. But take that in a representative sample, not just open a bag and grab something on top. But probe the bags just like the feed manufacturer does when he buys ingredients. Combine those samples together and split them down. Roll that up and save it. And just go through your crop, maintaining a sample of every bit because if you ever have a problem, you don't want it to be your problem. <laughs> you want to be able to go to someone else and say, hey, look, here's the feed. Let's analyze it and see what might be wrong with it. Yeah. Once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be, if I were a farmer, those would be the things that I would do.